name is Cal, and today I'll be talking about drones. Uh, I brought in a drone just to show, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, last 10 or 20 minutes, I walked around the room a bit, did a little survey on what people were interested in, hearing about, and I found that some people are really interested in the business model. Some people are, are entirely new to drones and just want to know what, how drones work. So today I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Um, first section, I'll talk mostly about what drones are, what technologies are in them, what makes the difference between a $3,000 drone and a $100 drone. And then following that, I will then talk about four things that you might want to know regarding uh, FAA rules for flying drones. That's where the name of the presentation comes from. And it's borrowed from a TEDx pen talk I gave a few years back. And then lastly, um, I'll talk a bit about how I got into drones four years ago. And I've since started a drone photography company. Uh, that does a lot of real estate work in Philadelphia. So, by show of hands, how many people have flown a drone before? Okay. Uh, how many people, so four people, um, how many people have seen a drone in person? Alright, cool. So, first I'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, first I'll show some photos, and then I'll talk about the drone. So, I've been, uh, making films and doing a lot of photography for the past eight years. Currently, I'm a second year robotics master student at Penn, and I'm also an official photographer for the school. So a lot of the photos you see on like the Penn social media, the Warren Instagram page, a lot of those are, uh, some, some of them are my work. And I'll just run through some photos that I've taken for my company in the past two years. This is a shot of the new Comcast Technology Center taken with the drone. A lot of people might wonder, how am I able to get the drone up that high? I thought the FAA rule says that you can't fly to 40 feet. Uh, I'll talk a bit about where the loophole is with this rule. <laughs> um, this picture is East Market. So this is down here is a big development by National Real Estate Development. And this was for the marketing uh, proposals for mostly the presentations. This is a photo of Bridge on Race, which is a new building just opened last two Decembers ago on 2nd and Ray Street. This is a shot of the Navy Yard when I was involved in the Amazon proposal a year and a half ago, uh, part of the Chamber of Commerce's bid for Amazon. This is a photo of 514 South Street, which is a new five-story uh, multifamily housing. And the investors wanted to showcase um, how the area relates to the city. Well, um, they wanted to acquire this property, and investors who were putting in the money wanted to know that there wouldn't be a lot of competition coming into the market. And so visually, they showed that over here you just have a lot of row houses, which are really difficult to zone to make larger, longer buildings. So this is a investor conference for the company. This is a shot of uh, every year Penn for the incoming freshman undergraduates as a photo on Penn Park. So I took this photo for the Office of University Communications. So this drone I brought in today is the drone that I mainly fly. And this is called the DJI Inspire 2. This drone weighs about 10 pounds. And what really differentiates it from any smaller drone is that it's able to carry a really good mirrorless camera. The camera is basically Hollywood quality in that it shoots 4K. Um, not just 4K, but it also shoots onto a solid state drive, which is back here. And because they were showing the solid state drive, um, basically over a drone shoot in an hour, it will fill up the amount of space on any of your laptops. It's like compressing a lot of data. And um, in terms of the sensors, though, turn this off for a sec. So generally, I'd, I'd say that the drone uses many things to try and keep stable. And this is for people who are needing to know how it works. So um, here's the camera on the bottom. So this is really what makes the drone special. It's really the reason they got this drone. Um, the drone runs for about $3,000, but if you add on a camera and the battery packs, extra battery packs, uh, expensive controllers, it's easily like a $10,000 setup. And some of the sensors that the drone has, the most important sensor is GPS because drones rely on GPS very heavily to know where the location is. It's not very accurate though. It's about within a meter accuracy. 
So even with GPS, sometimes um, the drum will still hover a little bit in place because it's not perfectly exact. Additionally, a lot of times when you're flying the drone in the city, so uh, in this case it's okay because there's not a lot of buildings around. But I'll show some photos that are where the drone's literally in Market Street, in between like 19th and 20th Streets. And there's no GPS because the drone's sticking out from the ground. You have these huge buildings towering around you. And when you don't have GPS, it's really challenging to fly because then the drone has to rely on other sensors. These two sensors on the bottom over here, this hole and this hole, these are two cameras, just normal RGB cameras like cameras on your phone. And these are what are called optical flow sensors. These sensors basically look downwards at the ground and it tracks any movement in the image. So if you see the image moving left, then you know the drone's moving right. And that's another way to have the drone stabilize. Down here, I think our Either sonar or ultrasound, they give you the distance to the ground, so the drone knows to automatically lower and raise its legs. And also, there are upward-facing sensors over here, so that if you're indoors, um, it won't hit the ceiling. Some people ask me if I want to fly the drone in here, but I wouldn't do that because it's, it's not that stable indoors. Um, another cool thing about GPS is that actually, um, there's a lot of redundancies built into the drone. So if the drone is far away, let's say the drone is here in the sky, I'm standing somewhere by the field right around here. A problem before with uh, remote controlled helicopters and such is that if my controller all of a sudden ran out of battery, I'd lose connection, the drone would just stay there and eventually just fall to the ground once it runs out of battery. But because the drone logs GPS information before it takes off, the drone knows to fly back laterally to above its position to descend to the ground. But there's a lot of problems with this too. A lot of DJI's earlier drones, like the smaller ones from four or five years back, which I'll show photos of later, a lot of those didn't have forward-facing sensors like this one does over here. And so, imagine the drone is on the other side of a building, uh, like one of these buildings I showed over here. Imagine I'm flying here. Um, I was, here I was literally on the other side of this parking lot, so it could have been the case. If the drone gets stuck behind a building, this is called losing line of sight. And if you lose line of sight, you don't have signal, and then the drone basically gets stuck and will eventually fall to the ground once it runs out of battery. So before, drones would basically just blindly fly back by GPS, but then they would hit the building on the way back with a forward-facing sensor. So now what the forward-facing sensor does is that it'll know, it'll see something, it'll fly up, go over that building, come back to. So these are some things that just make drones a lot safer to fly. Uh, next thing I'm going to talk about is some of the rules that the FAA has and some of their exceptions uh, that many people don't know about. So I'm going to highlight four main rules. Um, personally, I have a Part 107 commercial drone license. Um, it's an exam I had to take over the computer at a testing facility. And basically, the differentiation between that and any hobbyist flying is really just that I uh, can fly for commercial purposes to make money off of it, and that uh, I actually have a lot more rules placed on me, like I can't fly at night time. Whereas if any of you flew a drone, you can fly at night. So the first rule is that you should never fly within five miles of an airport. Where we're standing right here is about 5.9, about six miles outside of Philadelphia Airport. Northeast Airport is like 10 miles out, so we're okay there. Um, but there's actually an exception, is that you can get a waiver do this. So this is a shot that I took at the Navy Yard in Philadelphia. If you know where the Navy Yard is, it's literally uh, about one or two miles from the airport. This was a 5K that was going on, and it was partly for the Amazon proposal about a year and a half ago. There's a city in the background, there's a stadiums. And so here the airplanes are literally flying about 800 feet above the Navy Yard, above the southern tip when they land. So what I had to do is I had to spend about two months um, even met with someone from the FAA at their Howard Hughes Laboratory in Atlantic City, and then put in an application with the DC headquarters. Eventually, um, got this approved, but they limited my flight to 100 feet above ground level instead of the normal 400, and they also said that I uh, had to keep it within a very tight radius within a GPS location. So instead of being able to fly like wherever I want, it was like you can only fly within 0.5 miles of this position. The second rule is that you, most people think you should never fly 
400 feet above the ground. But as I said earlier, it's possible to fly higher. And basically the exception is it's unless it's within 400 feet of, of a structure. <coughs> and the logic here is that a helicopter is not allowed to fly within 400 or 500 feet of the building unless, of course, you're landing on it. And so the idea here is that you have this protective shield around the building. So this is like a drone shot of the Comcast Technology Center, which was purchased by Boston Partners, the architecture firm based in London. And this was taken about a year and a half ago as well. So here the drone is within 400 feet of the building. So um, you're okay to fly the angle. Um, one other thing to know is that you're not supposed to fly to, uh, within five miles from the airport. And some people ask, what about all the helicopter pads in the area? So near here, just up the street, we have the Presbyterian Hospital, I think, on 38th and Lancaster, 39th. There's also one, the Penn Star on 34th and Walnut. Uh, for Penn Medicine, there's South Dr. Pat near 12th and Market Street for Jeff's staff. And so basically I have all their numbers and before I fly I call the neighboring teleport, let them know exactly when I'm flying, what location, what height, and they will tell me if there's a helicopter coming in or not. They're generally really nice about it because I think legally drones get to use the class B airspace as well. So uh, normally they take down my phone number and if a helicopter is coming in, then they will call me to let me know uh, that the helicopter is coming in and I bring it down immediately. Or if there's a helicopter ready there about to take off, which is often the case with the 34th Street helipad, then I just wait until the helicopter takes off. But well, luckily they're not too busy. <laughs> um, okay, so here's another rule, is that you should never fly over large crowds of people and this one is more pretty logical because if anything happens to the drone, I mean a 10 pound drone flying on the sky is going to do a lot of damage. And so, unless there's actually no exception to this rule, so unless you get a waiver, uh, and this was me when I first started out, which I should have never done. This was before I got my license and when I first got the drone. But I got these really cool shots of Foley on, on College Street. So, so really cool shot. Uh, yeah. um, this one was not taken with this drone, it was a smaller drone at the time that I had. <coughs> this is probably my fourth generation drone now, I've upgraded a couple months a year. And then the last rule is to never fly at night, and following the theme, there's an exception here. The exception is, I was <laughs> sneak around the streets. <laughs> and so I did this and almost got arrested on uh, 4th of July 2017. But it made for really cool shots. Oh, <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. So these are shots taken on July 4, 2017 behind the Museum of Art. I was with a friend, and we had actually done this on June 30th as well, because Philly actually hosts three fireworks during the summer, because it's a huge thing here. And my friend and I are standing on the side of a, on, of a bridge, or on, the, on, a, on a highway ramp, because we want to take off when there's not a lot of people. And so the first 10 minutes we launched a drone and the drone is basically, um, so, so we launched a drone and the drone is uh, launching from front of us. The fireworks last about 15 minutes and when we launch the drone up, we get about 10 minutes of shots. We're really scared because I didn't know the rules that well at the time and I knew I was not supposed to fly at night time. But my logic was that for commercial purposes, you can't fly at night as a hobby as you can and I wasn't planning to sell footage. It's like a very green area. Um, and then after 10 minutes, because this was a previous version of the drone, the batteries used to only last 10 minutes. These last about 25 because there's two batteries on here. Um, we land the drone, and as the drone's landing on this highway ramp that's closed on the side of I think the 76 or whichever highway that is, this man just in dressed in really dark clothing carrying a backpack just suddenly walks over really briskly and he taps my friend Matt on the shoulder and tells us we have to land the drone immediately. And then I, I literally hear, I think, helicopters, like, above, and then this car suddenly drives up with, uh, with the headlights just flashing right at us. And so these two officers immediately surround us. <laughs> they're asking, like, why are you flying? Are you terrorists? Uh, cause they're, they're at, it was a counterterrorism unit of the Philadelphia Police Department. So they had to check out the third one. And, um, 
Alright, I didn't I didn't have my part one of seven license with me. They were just on my phone, so I'm struggling for a minute trying to follow it up while being really confused. Basically ask me a lot of questions and tell me that um, I can go home and that they'll contact me if I if they have any questions. But uh, the funniest part was that when we were about to leave, the officer who had been kind of silent in the back finally came up to take a look. And she was like, damn, that's the nicest drone I've ever seen. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that was the story there. And I've actually tried to get a night waiver since, and it's been really hard. I've put in three applications and been rejected every time. So I haven't been able to fly 30 minutes after sunset. Um, the thing about flying at night from a technical standpoint is that it's very hard to see the drone from far away because of just the physics behind how eyes work. A lot of pilots, when they fly at night, fly airplanes, also have problems seeing lights because if you focus your eye at the drone, Counterintuitively, you are actually not going to see it. You have to actually look to the side of the drone. Otherwise, it will just kind of disappear. So, is that the rationale of why we're not supposed to fly a drone at night? Is it to protect the pilots or protect the drones? I think it's mainly to protect pedestrians on the ground because if I fly the drone at night, it's going to be really hard to see random wires that are hanging across or tree branches. So for example, imagine just outside Huntsman, right? The bridge, you know how there's the wires for the trolley? If I took the drone off in there at night time, I wouldn't see the wires. Or it'd be really hard to see. So in the application, people are literally writing things like, I'm gonna buy this thousand dollar flashlight that's like a million lumens and shine it to look around. Like people come up with these really crazy solutions to try and get around this. Um, but it's generally just not safe. But before I flew some at night time, and it's also just when I find the drone back to try and land it, it's honestly pretty difficult to see how far away it is from me, and that makes it a little dangerous as well. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah. This is all on the federal level, so these regulations. How, yes. What are the implications for the state or for city? So yeah, all these I said are all federal level, that's correct. For city, uh, generally Philadelphia doesn't really have many rules. Um, you can't fly near the Constitution Center and the, like the Liberty Bell with the tourist feet. So that was enacted by FAA a year ago, so that's still federal <coughs> national monuments. In terms of city, I mainly try to stay away from the police building and city hall because uh, those are municipal buildings. But other than that, uh, for Philadelphia, there's not many rules. In Huntington Beach, where I'm from, and near LA and California and Orange County, um, there are rules against flying by the beach sometimes because there are helicopters that are routinely searching for sharks and other animals. And they fly really low, like 200 feet below that level. I have a video of that later. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so um, how I got into drones, so I mentioned that I've made a lot of films on campus, I've done a lot of photography, and during my sophomore year, I had a really good friend who I met named Josh, who um, Got, he showed me the drone for the first time, and this was the video of like our first flight, flying his drone, and this is what really piqued my excitement about four years ago. So this is by the Inspire 1, which is the generation before this one, and so we're just flying it through the IRS field. Um, and you can notice in this video that it takes off pretty fast when it accelerates, so it's really So basically, he had upgraded to this new drone, and he had a previously older drone that was broken. One of the arms is broken. It's called the Phantom 2. So here's a picture of it. Uh, I bought this from him in December of 2015, and I really sadly took it back to California over winter break. And I remember I was really tired that day, because I was really jet lagged. And I still jumped out of bed at 4 a.m. the next day, and just spent five hours straight fixing it up. I had bought a new shell, and kind of transferred all the electronics into the new shell. So on the right side of this picture, you see, I think the new shell, old shell, I'm basically transferring it. And the thing you'll notice about this drone is, look at the table, like look how many parts there are everywhere. There's like all these little screws, there's like battery chargers, there's so many things going on. In fact, on the underbelly of the drone back then, you had to actually literally glue the buttons on. It's not like this drone where the camera's built in and everything's going to the system. In this case, there's a GoPro 
And the GoPro is attached to this video transmitter on the bottom of the drone, and it's transmitting analog, so it's not very clear, it's not HD. I, and in order to see what I'm flying, I have a separate monitor with these really old patch antennas, or circular antennas, and GPS is really bad, you only see four satellites in the top right, whereas normally this will see eight. Um, and I can't control any settings on the camera, you can't move the camera, things like that. So it's very, very simple compared to uh, all in one switch like this nowadays. But within five hours, I ended up having the drone working, and so this was like a test, and then this is probably one of the happiest days of my life. Just got the drone working in the nearby park. Um, and then, because it's California, I was at the beach in December, and so my sister took this video. Oh, uh, it's so close to you now. Drone at the beach. And so there's just some yeah, camera. Now, what I didn't know at this time is that there are a lot of helicopters near the beach. Where do you go? And so, when there's helicopters there, they routinely come, they're really low, about 240 feet. So, I got really scared the first time, I just like, brought the drone down really quickly. And now I generally just don't fly over the water. Um, and my brother flies drones a lot, he flies racing drones in California a lot. So, I told him the same thing, but he doesn't really listen to me. <laughs> But this is a drone photo of Huntington Beach. This was taken with the Phantom 4, which is the generation after my first drone. So um, comes, so I spend about a year and a half just doing this for fun. I don't have a license. I'm not making money off the drone. I take a lot of photos for the Penn social media. And, and um, eventually I make this music video for this really popular acapella group on campus called Penn Masala. So this was in the Indiana factory in West Philadelphia. which I'll share the link with you later. I've open sourced all these all this pen footage. And so to date there's been about 40 pen groups to use in their like recruiting videos, club videos, etc. Even the official pen card website has like the drone shots as the background. And um, this is just me after I got my carbon seven license. Really nice. This is in Northeast Philly at the Indian Institute. <laughs> Alright, so then after this I have my uh, drone license, and um, the next question was how am I going to get my first customer? So now I'm going to transition more to more on the business side, whereas the first half of the talk has been mostly on the technical side. So um, this is about May of 2017, right after finals, I got my drone license, and I really wanted to break into the commercial real estate space because there are a lot of cranes in Philly at the time, even more than there are now. And I thought that there could be a big business opportunity here in terms of marketing. So the first weekend on Sunday, um, right after that, I went out and I read an article on Curb Philly and just tracked some of the new real estate developments. I figured that the best way in order to get clients in this case, acquisition costs essentially would be just going out and shooting their properties and then sending the photo to them and then, and then seeing if they want to do a meeting. Because I figured that once they saw the picture in front of them, the developers or architects would be more willing to want to meet. And so the first weekend on the Sunday morning, I went out and shot these four buildings. Um, so does anyone recognize these buildings in Philly? <coughs> All right. The Comcast Technology Center? Yep, that's right. Yeah. 
What about what about the one on the top left? This is on Drexel's campus. Mm -hmm. yes. This one is the uh, V32. The top right is 12th and Market, the East Market Ludlow, and then the bottom left is 12th and Walnut. So, anyways, I went out and shot these, and the same day I sent out these photos to a lot of press because I had no clients at the time, no marketing budget, and the whole reason I started doing this commercially was really honestly because I wanted to buy a new drone, the Inspire One. It'd be three thousand dollars, and my internship wasn't going to pay enough after tax to buy it. So I sent it out, and actually by the next day, um, I was actually covered by a lot of groups, particularly of the Contest Technology Center. And so these are just some screenshots of Kirk Philly, NBC, at least 10 or 20 articles came out. And within that same week or two, I had my first four drone shoes, which is random buildings in Philly, and um, had almost got 2,000, so almost at my goal of raising time in the drone. And so I remember my approach to flying drones back then was really uh, hacky in the sense that I would just literally take one of those indigo bikes at like 5 a.m. in the morning because in the summer the sunrise is really early and I want to get the sunrise <coughs> shot. And I would put this drone right here uh, in the front pocket of my bike and then I'd put there uh, 6 a.m. One, one time I rode from Radian and 39th Street all the way to like, 2nd Street. Um, and then did a drone shoot in the morning. This was a shot, this is one of my first shots as well for 1919 Market. And this one, the client here was the company that was brokering the transaction. This was for sale. And it was a very difficult shoot because the drone here is in the city. You see that there's a building over here on the right side. And it was very hard locking and GPS signal when I was on the ground. So when I launched the drone into the air, it was actually literally hovering like three feet at a time. And normally when it flies, you're supposed to keep direct line of sight on the drone, but realistically it's almost impossible because you have to look down to see what you're shooting. So I kind of had to look up and down a lot, and the drone's literally right above. So shoots like these are actually really scary for me because what if a strong crosswind comes about all of a sudden, blows the drone three feet over and crashes into the side of the skyscraper? Um, what if the the compass interference from, there's a compass in here to know what's due north and south. There's a lot of uh, magnetic interference from all the buildings. And what if that makes the drone suddenly start yawing side to side? So these are a lot of challenges in that. Um, these are some other use cases. So this was for a real estate development firm that constructed the town center near King of Mall, And this was a shot to show uh, what they'd done for their investors. And then a neat use case I saw for drones is that uh, one of the, the developers I met with, which was actually the one on the top right here, uh, National Real Estate Development, when they were building their second residential tower, a lot of their tenants were 